joining us now. You can feel free to turn on your cameras at any point if you'd like. Everyone will be muted during the presentation, but at the end, we can do a Q&A via the chat um, and or manipulating the sound. Okay, I think everyone's all settled in now. My name's Amanda Sutton. I'm the Events and Marketing Director for Bookworks, and I'm coming at you from my home studio in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We're very pleased today to have an author with us that we have scheduled a few times this year. So we're happy to finally be doing this event. Uh, Sergio Troncoso coming to us from Connecticut. He has a new book of stories out called A Peculiar Kind of Immigrant Son. This came out in the spring. We set up a couple of events and the pandemic foiled us. So here we are meeting virtually, which is kind of cool and better because people from anywhere can now join us. So we're happy to see you all. Um, welcome. We're pleased to be working here with you during the pandemic. Bookworks is open four days a week for you locals uh, for curbside service. So we have curbside on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturdays from 10 to 2, and then also on Wednesdays from 2 to 6. So you can order at our website, which is bookworks without the O's. That's B-K-W-R-K-S dot com. And if you're in Albuquerque, you can come pick that up at our shop. If you live somewhere else, we're happy to send you a copy of Sergio's book or anything else that your little reading heart desires. So again, if you're just joining us, thank you so much for being here. Happy Halloween, everyone. We're with Sergio Troncoso, and he will be speaking this afternoon with Valerie Martinez, our friend from the National Hispanic Cultural Center, the Director of History and Literary Arts. Thank you, Valerie, for partnering with us again on this event. We've done five or six of these this fall, and it's been really fun to hear the conversations. So thank you for joining us. Uh, we will have some questions and a reading. If you have a question during the reading, feel free to type it into the chat, either to everyone or to myself, and we can ask the author at the end. Sergio is from El Paso, El Chuco, our neighbor to the south. We're very pleased to hear some stories from him today. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Valerie and Sergio. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Again, I'm Valerie Martinez, Director of History and Literary Arts at the National Hispanic Cultural Center. We are so thrilled and so happy to present um, readings with Bookworks. We love Bookworks, our local independent bookstore. And um, so we're really pleased to be able to continue to, to do this virtually. Uh, I want to just send out wishes to all of you uh, to be safe and healthy. And I'm hoping that all your beloveds are also well. I know this is a particularly tough time. And so for me, having to be able to read and to talk about books has been an incredible balm. And so I know that's true of all of you or you wouldn't be here today. So I'm gonna formally introduce Sergio and then I am gonna remember at the end to ask him to talk about two new books that, he that will be coming out next year. But uh, for today, we're gonna talk about his collection of stories. And the way this is gonna unfold is I'm gonna introduce Sergio, ask him to read, we'll have a little chat, ask him to read again. Um, I have lots of questions from reading the book. If we have time, he'll read one more time, then we'll open up the, the room for Q&A. So do write down those questions. And uh, so that's how today will unfold and we'll be here for about an hour. And um, so I'm so glad to see all your faces. And if I can't see your faces, I see your names. And again, once more, thank you for being here. So Sergio, I'm gonna read your, your bio and um, then ask you to read. Sergio Troncoso is the author of The Last Tortilla and Other Stories and Crossing Borders, Personal Essays and the novels, The Nature of Truth and From This Wicked Patch of Dust. He has taught at the Yale Writers' Workshop for many years. A Fulbright Scholar and winner of numerous literary awards, Troncoso was inducted into the Hispanic Scholarship Fund's Alumni Hall of Fame and the Texas Institute of Letters. He was born in El Paso, Texas and attended Harvard College and Yale, where he earned graduate degrees in international relations and philosophy. Sergio, welcome, and we can't wait to listen to you read from the book. 
Thank you, Valerie, um, uh, for inviting me to, to Albuquerque in a way, so virtually. And, uh, and also uh, Bookworks, thank you for selling my book. And I've actually read at Bookworks before COVID. I love independent bookstores. So please buy the heck out of this book or any book simply to support independent bookstores. You know, they're the independent voices out there that really matter to authors, certainly like me. Um, I, I'm gonna read, before I read, I, I wanna tell you a little bit about the collection simply because it's unusual. Uh, it is a book of 13 stories and they're all, the, the themes are about immigration, but it's also, and so you have immigrants uh, from coming from the border, but going deep into the United States, going into Connecticut, going into New York, to the Midwest. Some of them recent immigrants who don't know English. Uh, for example, uh, Jimena Garza, a Guatemalan immigrant that has a, a conflict with a police uh, woman in New York. And then there are other people who have quote unquote made it and are, are now uh, deep into American society and yet somehow they have some sort of issue with, with their immigrant status. And, and that'll be the first story I read. But the other thing to think about in this collection is, and, be, and then I'll start reading right away, is that it's also about perspectivism. Anybody who knows me, and some, I have some, some of my friends here from college and, and even from my workshop, they know that I'm heavily into philosophy. And I'm, I'm heavily into German philosophy, Nietzsche and Wittgenstein and Heidegger. And I learned German and, and, and lived there uh, for a little bit after um, school. To, to study some of these great writers. And so the, the, the stories are grouped together and twos and threes in the table of contents. And within these twos and threes, characters appear and reappear from a different angle. So you will see a, a, a character, you'll read them in the first story. And then in the next story, you'll read that same character from a different perspective. And you'll, I would hope, ask you, yourself the question, did I really understand who this person was? And, and it keeps going through the collection. Um, and in part, one of the issues I, I, I'm sort of uh, working out as a person who really loves philosophy is this uh, you know, concept of how many selves we are. Just like I am the, the self who grew up on the border who had an outhouse in the backyard. And, you know, my first job was carrying live chickens from trucks. And I'm also the self that now teaches at Yale, that met Mary Ellen Levine at Harvard College. And uh, I'm also the self that's the father. I'm a guy who chops wood outside here in rural Connecticut. So all of these different selves make up who I am in, in many ways. And, and really that's the struggle of identity, trying to piece together who you are from, from these many different histories and possibilities and cells that we have. So anyway, so in this first story, the, it's called uh, a Rosary on the Border. And th this guy, David Calderon, he's in his 50s. And he's, uh, he lives in Connecticut and he's, he's a professor in Connecticut. And he's going back to Isleta, to that little rural hamlet in El Paso where he grew up. And he's going back to bury his father. And so this event causes a lot of things in his mind to, to bubble up. Who, who is he? Who did he become? Why did he leave the border? Who is he now that he lives so far away from, from where he started? Does he belong in the United States, even though he's quote unquote made it, you know, economically, professionally, et cetera. And so in this section I'm reading, it's a remembrance of when David was 21 and he had graduated from college and he's in South Station in Boston and he's having a fight with his parents. It wasn't the money. It was another of my weaknesses. That's what my father used against me at South Station. His green eyes glinted like the edges of Damascus steel. A snide little comment that sliced between my ribs like a switchblade about my girlfriend, Jean a blue-eyed beauty from Concord, Massachusetts, my lovely and loving Jean, who had sought them out with her college Spanish and laughed heads together with my mother. Jean, who had accompanied me to El Paso for Thanksgiving, my senior year. Jean, who was more delicate and sophisticated than the richest Anglo girl they had ever come across in El Paso, Texas. 
my father at South Station. Why would Gene want to stay with someone who doesn't know what he's doing, who doesn't have a job? It's time to stop living in a fantasy world. It's time to be a man. I hated him for pitying what he imagined Gene was and what he believed I would never be. I hated him for not believing in me. I hated him for not giving me another chance. I hated him for wanting to slam the door shut on what I could be. I told my mother because I knew it would hurt her. And I told my father too, because he was next to her. I told him I had always felt abandoned and adopted, that they had always favored my brothers and my sister, that I knew I wasn't loved by them in Isleta. I was shouting at them even as hot tears slashed across my cheeks. I didn't care that a few others turned to stare at us in that waiting room cavern. I didn't care about the propriety or impropriety of what other, others thought of me, unlike my father. It was a moment when I had felt the most alone in my life, more than that first day as a freshman, when I had stumbled with my old suitcases into the dingy one-room cell carrying two dozen flautas wrapped in foil from Isleta. Thoreau, too, had once been in dark exile in Hollis Hall. I was that iconoclast's Mexican brother. Only a few minutes to go and they would have to leave for their train. I wanted to punch my father. My mother in tears said, of course she loved me. My father held back, embarrassed, watching both of us as if we were insane. He averting his green eyes from mine. Waiting for him to stand up, I stared through him, my chest heaving in spasms. My mother's hand reached to hold mine, to calm me. I believed and did not believe what I had said. I still wanted to punch him. I had felt so alone for so many years. Part of it was what I had done by leaving home. Part two was having never felt at home in Isleta. Then my father, inhaling, finally meeting my eyes again, said, we love you, David, but sometimes we didn't know what to do with you. You are not like any of us. I think my father said these words because he never wanted to see my mother in pain. I think he said them because he didn't want to see his grown son angry and out of control at South Station, surrounded by strangers. He may have even meant what he said too. I don't know. We said our goodbyes. I hugged and kissed both of them politely. My head throbbed. I was alone and I had always been alone and they had been together and would always be together. It took me years to understand what this meant. I made many decisions, some awful and others brilliant, but I found ways to keep that openness in my soul that meant more to me than breathing. I told them over the years what I had, was doing, how I was trying what no one in my family had ever tried to do. When I was failing, I admitted that as well, and they listened politely. I also knew that's all they could do. One lonely night in Connecticut, I pulled myself from a window's ledge, no one else next to me. Another day, I chose to do something someone like me should have never accomplished, and yet I did, and kept going. I learned to recognize when others like Jean were much better than me because they had faith in my soul. I believed in very little, but I kept going until I would get tired or defeated. And then I would take time to discover another wall to throw myself at. I was, and I am, and I will be a peculiar kind of immigrant son. I got old and that made everything better, including me. So that's from, from the first story, Rosary on the Border. I hope you liked it, Valerie. I did. So I have, we'll never get through all the questions that I have from reading the book. 
one thing that I, in, in some of the early stories in this collection, there are two migrations happening, right? There's an, the immigrant son, but there's the, the main character often the narrator who's migrated to a different part of the country, mm -hmm. right? El Paso and the East Coast. And I find those stories are exploring that uh, sense of displacement and isolation, which is within one country, but in two very, very different places. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Well, it, it's something I think that happens to a lot of people when they leave home. And in certain respects, all of us leave home, of course, because we don't stay as children. We don't stay with our parents. We uh, move, we go to school. But sometimes those ruptures and displacements are very dramatic. And, and so certainly for me and some of the characters that I, that I write about, and they're, by the way, they're not necessarily me. M most people assume, oh, it's you, you're writing about yourself. And it's not, it's, it's maybe a version of me. It may be a, a literary version of me, but it's not necessarily me. But what, when the displacement is very dramatic, when you go from extreme poverty and, and, you know, and, and hunger and, and really not even knowing the language to, you know, the highest places of academia in the United States and beyond that. Um, I think if you're a thoughtful person, you start asking yourself, uh, what did you learn? What did you lose? What can you keep from the old world, whatever that old world was, that's still valuable? What do you throw away that maybe you don't want to? For me, one of the issues, certainly as a person, was like machismo. I never liked my father's machismo. Um, and and the, the, the heroes in my family were, uh, and I love my father. I think my father was, a, was a, uh, a, a, he taught me to work until I drop and work on, and, and do it again the next day. And uh, in an essay that I just published in New Letters, I called him our Mexican Stalin. Um, he really took us from a pre-agrarian life to a middle-class life through our blood, sweat, and tears. But he taught me uh, to work like uh, no one else. And I've, I've given that same kind of value system to my kids. My kids, um, you know, they called me the toughest father on the Upper West Side. Why? Because when they did not have homework, I gave them homework. This is Saturdays and Sundays, writing homework, math homework. Um, I taught them, you know, what my mother would say to us all the time, which is, there is no tired in my house. You know, there's no Saturday, Sunday, there's no summer. In the summer, you're going to learn another language, you're going to push ahead on algebra or calculus, or the second year of calculus. And this is how you move forward. It's not about feeling privileged, so it's the opposite of being privileged. It's, it's really being extremely hungry. So those things from my father I, I, I loved, but I did not like how he treated my mother. I did not like that. My mother, I think in many respects, was smarter than my father, but she didn't have, you know, the opportunities. She, my mother could have been a CEO at a, at a, at a certainly a, of a company. And so, so, so I think this issue of psychological issue of displacement, what do you keep what do you chuck away? How do you create a self when you go through so many places, linguistically, geographically, culturally? Um, you know, who, who are you? You know, when, when you go through all of this. And I think that's a fund fundamentally a philosophical question, which, which is why I ended up in philosophy, really, <laughs> you know, intellectually. Um, so the, I hope that sort of answers a little bit of this issue of displacement. So, and, and by the way, I don't, I don't think displacement is all that bad. <laughs> we, because what I mean by is, I, I hate following the crowd. I am not a lemming. In fact, I think most of the time people around me, they're a bunch of idiots and, you know, they're not really doing things the right way or they, they don't, you know, they don't press hard. And, and I'm talking about my friends, you know, other fellow writers. Uh, I don't think they write in a way that to the core and issues that, that we face. And be, why? Because they want to be popular. They want to sell a lot of books. So they, they, they try to ape what the readers want. I don't do that. 
you know, I'm writing literary fiction. If it sells, great. But if it gets you right in the heart and, and opens something that you never thought you, you, you had, then I feel like I've done my job. So, so for me, my primary purpose is not entertainment. Yes, I want to write stories that people love. But for me, my, my primary purpose is to open up deep questions within you as the reader, you know, to, to help you look at yourself and, and other people um, in a new way. Um, it, it's, um, so anyway, so, so, I, so, so I think displacement, it's okay to be an iconoclast. It's okay to be different. In fact, it's great to be different. And in my workshop, by the way, I tell them I like the weirdos. I like people writing experimentally. I like the people testing the edges of narrative, you know, changing what a novel could be or what a story could be. You know, George Saunders is one of my favorite writers and he's always testing what a story is. He's not just repeating what the success he had before. He's, he's actually rolling the dice and throw, trying something different. And, and for me, that, that's usually a person who's never happy with where they are. And, and so does yeah. that make sense? It does. And, and I think what's really interesting about that is, so displacement has been written about in literature forever, right? And I think what you bring to that is both that kind of resonance with many works, you know, many great works of literature, but particular places, right? That hometown of Isleta and those sort of East Coast. I mean, I think that's what makes it different is is that you're you're also talking about culture. There's like universal themes, as we say, right? Because all children who leave home to go away, right? The the encounter between the children and the parents is one of that, of, of, of having gone away and coming back and that distance that's created. But because your particular places and home is a particular place, and the, the father in this story was an immigrant from another place in some ways that adds layering or texture to a kind of, as we say, age old subject um, that makes the book seem contemporary and relevant now because we can bring to the book the current events, uh, you know, along the border and immigration in particular ways that allow us to, you know, allow you to keep writing about things that have been written about for a long, long time. Right, and, and I think a fundamental question in the book is what is an American? What is, it? What is even the best American? And, and as you see in the next story, which I'm not reading, but it's called New Englander, David is back in Connecticut. And he, he's like, you know, he, he's like me. He has a, a button down shirt. He looks like he, he's always belonged in the Northeast, you know, product of Harvard and Yale. And somebody calls him a spick and attacks him you know, because they're jealous of his success. And, and, and so the question at that story, but it goes to the whole book is, who is really the true New Englander, right? The person who worked their ass off to get to where they wanted to get to, who sacrificed, who, you know, who were, who's more akin to the pilgrims when they came over with nothing, facing a hostile environment, uh, refugees from their own, country and and fighting to succeed and so so of course that's really the fundamental question in those two stories it's what is a really a, a true american a true pilgrim here is it really the mexican guy or is it this white guy who assumes i'm supposed to have it all and you have it what i want and and so so it, it really does get deep into these questions of what, what is really the true american and i i certainly believe the good let's say Mexican immigrants that I know are really reinvigorating this country. They're showing you what the values used to be of those people that you used to hold on high like the pilgrims um, and, and making it through backbreaking work, uh, fighting a hostile uh, you know, uh, environment and succeeding despite these headwinds. Um, and, and so, so, so I think in many ways, that's, that's certainly my philosophy. And I wouldn't say like all Mexican immigrants are like that. There's some who, people who I certainly got away from in Isleta, but, but the good ones I think are, are invigorating this country. Mm. I, hope, I hope that makes sense. It does, thank you. <laughs>
So should I continue? Yeah, please read some more. So I'm going to read something a little different, which I, I don't usually read, but it's, it's a middle story called Library Island. Because as the, the, the book starts with realistic stories, and as you progress into the, the collection, it starts becoming more dystopian and surreal. And so, and, and this is also commentary on where we are as a country in many ways. Um, and so in Library Island, uh, and, and if you wanna ask me how I got this idea, but it's, it's a story in which uh, it's reading as torture. This, uh, it, yeah, in, imagine that reading as torture. Um, and it's um, Arturo is in a place like New York City. It's a futuristic New York City. And society around him is falling apart. People are at each other's throats. There are riots in the streets, uh, whether it's leftists or rightists. A few of his friends are killed. And, and, and people don't believe in the truth anymore. You know, um, it's... Uh, it's not hard to imagine an America like that. I hope we don't get there, but, but that's what's happening. And it's called the outer world. And he hears about this place called Library Island in the West somewhere through, through gossip and other people. And a few of his friends set out to find Library Island. And um, as they get closer and they, they're hiking through an area in the West, it's indeterminate where it is. They're uh, accosted by guards and apparently they've, they've been, you know, they've, they're thrown in cells and apparently they have gotten into Library Island but they cannot be accepted until they go through these grueling reading tests. So the people who get into Library Island are people who are heavy readers. And so every 10 days, um, these people get 25 books to read and they get an interlocutor who has to um, find out if they've read the book. And if they haven't read the books, well, something awful happens to them. And so it goes through hundreds of books. And so in this particular part I'm gonna read, uh, Arturo has already gone through 15 shipments of, of, of 25 books each. And, and he's about to crack, he's just exhausted. And, and, and so a new interlocutor comes in to test them on number 15 on the 15th shipment. I hear a perfunctory knock at my door. The lock turns and the bolt shrieks open. My new interlocutor steps into my cell. I am ready. Test for shipment number 15. After my eighth book, I stop mid explanation and plead with my interlocutor what would you would really happen if I didn't read a book if if you say I can't adequately explain it? Did you go through this? When does this stop? I have asked these questions many times, but it is the first time I receive more than just a strange smile, silence, or a warning. Her eyes seem even kind. My heart flutters in my chest, a sparrow trapped underneath armor. Let's go to the next one. I don't even know your name. I get a new person every shipment. Please, just a few answers. The woman looks behind her, waits, seeing with her ears through the door's portal. I appreciate her appearance for the first time through the swells of my fear and anger. She is athletic in a fitted navy blue dress, auburn haired like Jacqueline's, but a touch darker green eyes behind black librarian's glasses. Freckles dot her cheeks and cover her neck. My bone deep exhaustion envelops my head like an invisible mask and I almost fall forward in my chair. Have they placed her here because of what happened to Jacqueline? We hear the guard's footsteps in the hallway but he is not visible. It's Elizabeth, she whispers, just keep going. You have made remarkable progress and are already showing signs of permanent mental change. Can't say anything else. You are almost there. Permanent change? What? Let's keep going. Thank you for telling me your name. It's been so long. Please, Elizabeth, what if I collapse and die of a heart attack? I can't keep going forever. 
I will until I can't, I will until I do find her beautiful yet so far away from where I am. I feel disgusting next to her, disheveled. I am a rock trying not to be crushed to bits. She is a jewel shining through time. I stare just a second too long at her shapely body and at those cat eyes against the pallid skin. She blushes. I convince myself her eyes glisten with a certain longing without words. I convince myself she believes in me, this awful me, this wretch. She just might believe. Don't, I mean, don't collapse the next one. Elizabeth turns her head again to the portal and whispers, it's much easier once you are a citizen. You still have reading. You must do the mental work every month, but you gain an appeals process, a second chance if something goes wrong. You gain your freedom among us. You can live with someone who must also read, and that helps. It's much easier. You'll see, Arturo. Elizabeth, what happens? They get rid of you. You mean they release you to the outer world? They get rid of you expunged. You will never have existed. They kill you? Is that what happened to Jacqueline? I mean, how can they, you, justify that? How? Isn't this an island of reason? Of sanity? What's the difference between this and the outer world? My God! Arturo, keep your voice down. We'll both be in trouble. Everything is monitored but I think there's a certain leeway granted to those beyond 15 shipments. You are there. She almost made it. That's beyond your control. You have to understand and appreciate what we have achieved, what we will protect at all costs. Behind Elizabeth's beauty radiate the quiet ferocity and stillness and uncanny self-possession the timbre of her voice still echoes in my ears. She stares at a corner of the room where a triangle of black glass shimmers in the half light. For the first time, I notice a palpita palpitating green dot at the center of this triangle. They kill you? Worse than that, much worse. I like you, Arturo, but don't give up. If you make it, I'll look for you. I also work at the integration center, she says. The sudden terror in her eyes jolts my heart to a faster beat. Let's keep going. A neon red dot glows inside the triangle. I think of only Elizabeth, the details of her movements, the sound of her voice as I answer her questions. I am answers only for her. Anyway, that's from Library Island. Thank you. You know, when I got to this story, which is later in the book, everyone, I was like, what? I mean, it was, it came as a, just a really wonderful surprise. And I, it made me think about, um, you know, when you put a, a collection, whether it's poetry or stories, you know, you want to sort of maintain everyone's interest all the way through. It's important, especially as a book, I think, starts to get the last third. It seemed to me perfectly placed, but it was so different. So my first question is, where did this idea come from? <laughs> well, I, I was, uh, a couple of years ago, I was chosen, I was asked by the Penn Faulkner uh, Foundation to be one of three national judges for the Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction. And more people submit to the Penn Faulkner than the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, that year, we had a record number of entries, uh, 493 books. And everybody from Joyce Carol Oates to Stephen King to you name them, they're in there. Uh, it's a very difficult uh, prize to win, and it's judged by writers. And so, you know, you're, you're asked to do this once in your life. <laughs> and I was asked um, in 2016. And so uh, you have nine months to read these books and you're paid money not to teach to just dedicate yourself to reading so I was reading about 15 to 18 hours per day two books a day 
and you get these 10 ship you get these shipments every uh, every 10 days of 25 books and it's like it's like a tsunami of books always coming in and 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 you're terrified because of course you don't want to blow it right you're you know this is your you know you're going to be reporting this to the washington post to the new york times and you're one of three writers and the other writers are great writers and and so you don't want to blow it you don't want to be the one who just collapses so you know i was reading my ass off and 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 my wife laura got me a special chair where I was reading and reading and reading and um, literally about 15 to 18 hours a day. And, uh, and then of course, writing notes and we're exchanging emails that sometimes are five pages long and we're having Skype calls and we met once in New York. And, and at the uh, end of the process, um, at a certain point, um, my, my right leg got numb and I called it my Penn Faulkner blood clot. Oh um, yeah, right. And, and, and so when I told the Penn Faulkner people at the big gala at the Shakespeare Folgers Theater in, in Washington, D.C., they said, you know, you didn't really have to read all the books, but I, I wanted to do a good job. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and I did. But one of the things it does when you read so crazily, it makes you so sharp on your aesthetic abilities to judge problems in a book within the first paragraph of language, of sentence construction, characterization, you know, it just makes you merciless, not, not just with other people's work, but with your own work. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's definitely what it did to me. And, and by the way, just to just quickly to, to, to give you sort of something interesting that happened. So you're given deadlines to announce your top 20 and to announce your five and all five of the, of the finalists get money, very good money. And then you announce your winner and it announced to the Washington Post and the New York Times, et cetera. So when we announced our five and then we announced our winner, uh, two and a half weeks, three weeks later, after we had announced our winner, who was James Hanahan for Delicious Foods, a great book, very innovative in many ways. Um, three weeks after we announced it, uh, one of our five won the Pulitzer Prize. Oh. So we had the Pulitzer Prize before the P Pulitzer Prize Committee. And I felt like we did our job. We did a great job. <laughs> and in fact, the Penn Faulkner people told us that was the first and only year in which the judges had picked not only the Penn Faulkner winner, but at the same event in May and at, at the Folgers Theater, they also had the recent Pulitzer Prize winner, which was Viet Cong Nguyen. Uh -huh. in, 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 uh, in the sympathizer. So we did our job, but it was, but it's, 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 it's gonna, it's like reading <laughs> where you're gonna feel like you're gonna die. Uh, and so I said, I'm gonna write a story about this. Yeah, with a deadline. Right. And you know what else is, I love about this story is there is, you know, talk about moving across the country to me it was very 19th century. It goes from the urban to the rural, right? Library Island is in a, in a rural place or um, sort of like a forest, right? And I right. wondered, you know, if that was purposeful um, and maybe why? Well, it, 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 is, it is about getting away from the noise of the city, the noise of society in many ways. Uh, and it's also about what reading does to your mind, heavy reading. Reading makes you a better citizen, makes you more critical. You don't take the crap, the, the crap that you hear at Fox News or even CNN or whatever. You find information for yourself when you're a heavy reader and, and, and you become a better citizen. But so, so, so I think, you know, these people, people and all of us do it. I mean, I'm on Facebook and I'm on Twitter and Instagram and all this stuff. It kind of lessens your thinking ability. And, and so the, 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 the less we read, the more we, we really base our choices and, and votes and whatever on prejudices, on really stupidities. And, and we lose the ability to do complex thinking, you know, much more involved thinking in which things are not black and white, good or bad, you know, uh, and, 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 and this sort of good and bad, you know, Plato warned us about this in, 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 in the, you know, way back when, when we start focusing and living our, our world just through images, 
we become simpletons. We, and, we become, and, you know, we, we stop being thinkers. And, you know, there is, you know, this story is also about the truth, right? This idea that in the city, there is no truth, right? There's just all these competing perspectives. And in some ways, going to Library Island, where you're immersed in books, isn't so much about finding the truth, but maybe about this complexity, right? That is about nuance and not about what social media often gives to us, which is not nuanced. And right. so I found that story really relevant in the sense that even though there's torture in Library Island, right, this forced reading is a forced immersion, a forced displacement, if we talk about that, away from what people are fighting about in the city, which is, you know, echoes this idea of social media and this lack of truth to this intense experience of immersing oneself in books, which is a different kind of truth, I guess, or right. uh, would you call that a truth? Yeah, and, and I think the best way is, frankly, you know, to be a reader and then also be involved in your community, to be going back and forth, not just an egghead stuck in your library and not just involved in the social media squabbles of the day, but going back and forth, really having each feed on the other and help the other mm -hmm. to, be, to become a more considered human being in many ways. Great. How about reading once more and then we'll open it up for a Q&A. Okay, so I'm going to read just from the last story, which is uh, called Eternal Return. And for those of you who know a little bit of Nietzsche, it's uh, certainly a concept from, from Nietzsche. And, and in this particular story, Vendo Claridad, that's his name, Vendo, is going back home to El Paso. And all, all sorts of odd things are happening in this story. Uh, a cat is floating in the air. Uh, he's talking to his dead grandmother, who of course is not there. And he's even going through matter. Like at one point he drinks this strange Mexican chocolate and he finds himself stuck in between a wall. Um, so, so, and in, in many ways, this story kind of encapsulates the different perspectives of time and place and, and really uh, mind that, that happened to a person. And so at the, this is the very end of the, of, the, of, the, of the story in which Vendo is having one of these visions. It is unclear what this next scene is, whether it's in the past or the future, and Vendo is trying to make sense of it, trying to find where he is, what he is, whether he is. He is not there, but it's as if he's seeing the world through someone else's eyes. It's this Miss Russell, and she has what Vendo wants, a certain fame or acceptance or attitude. She has brown hair and wears round tortoiseshell glasses. Her skin is whitish with the slightest tan and her eyes hazel. But it's those eyes that see Vendo in a way he has never imagined himself. Does he even know a Ms. Russell? Her eyes stare at him like a doll's eyes, unrepentant, and in a way taking the totality of him in as if to say, do what I do, why can't you? What stops you? Her face grins at him hard with big front teeth just the slightest bit too big for her mouth, which remind Vendo of a rabbit, but also poised with her big eyes as if Miss Russell wants to eat him. For Vendo, as he tries to make sense of this wavery image of this Miss Russell, what brings the image finally together in his mind is her hair, this well-to-do do of perfectly coiffed chestnut brown, like a banker's or an Upper East Sider's. This face, a mystery he cannot have, a perspective that attracts and repels at once a chasm too far from his own face and eyes. Why does this image of he is seen through Ms. Russell's eyes make him feel so alone? Vendo is trying to gather himself, trying to get away from Ms. Russell's eyes or inside her head or wherever he is. He cannot. He feels dizzy. What he feels is something very primal, as if he's leaping back in time to the womb and into what seems like a womb, a cave, Vendo hears echoes only, 
certain rhythms and sounds. He can see nothing in front of him, but he hears what he thinks are his parents, their voices. They make him happy. And when they clarify, when he can hear complete phrases, that soothes him. They are the songs in Spanish from his mother. But around him, he also feels this chill, as if a bear awaits the baby, as if without his parents singing these songs, an animal will pounce on him. Vendo is terrified, but he doesn't remember any fight with a wild beast from his deep past or his recent days. Why is there this fear beyond the present darkness? What is this fear? They lived in El Paso. They were Mexicanos from the border, leaving Mexico and becoming American. In El Paso, it was a there, but outside, beyond the border, what happened? He is nowhere. Vendo the phantasm still cannot see in front of him. Maybe he gulped down too much of that chocolate, but he can feel what is around him, that bear, that animal menace, a certain eerie fundamental displacement with a touch of an awaiting cascade into catastrophe. He is behind in a race he knows nothing about. That is what he feels. He was born behind. But no, that certainly isn't it. He is in a race where he doesn't know the rules and doesn't know how to avoid mistakes and dangers. Yet he has no choice but to race. He chose to be in the race, and that's the terror. That's the bear behind him. That's the fear around him somehow. Vendu in this darkness is stuck in a labyrinth of his choices and the choices of those who came before him. This labyrinth of many dimensions is closing in on him, approaching from all sides. He can feel the walls breathe him in. It is next to him, everything and nothing are next to him. He reaches out. Abuelita, Abuelita, I am waiting for you. Thank you. Yay! Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sergio. And now we'll take people's questions. Amanda's really good at this part. So Amanda, we'll have you take a look at the chat. Um, and or if you'd like to unmute and ask a question, we'll We'll take it that way too. Okay, well, thank you so much. That was such a treat to hear you read, Sergio. Thank and you, Amanda. Your questions, always provocative. Um, it was really nice to hear you talk about the book vis-a-vis -vis the stories that added so much to the meaning on some of those. All right, folks, so what questions do we have? It looks like Abby was asking about the other Faulkner finalists in 2016. I had to look it up too, I was curious. So, so, I so I think I remember most of them. Okay. Uh, Luis Urea, The Water Stories. Mm -hmm. And then we had Mendocino Fire. Um, and, and it's a, a, I'm trying to remember the, 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 um, the woman's name. She teaches at Stanford. Elizabeth Talent. Elizabeth Talent. Yeah, she's great. She's a fantastic writer. Uh, and then we had um, Julie Uromaya, Doctor, Doctor. Um, yep. Um, who's a, a great writer who uh, I think her ancestry, her parents are from Nigeria, but she grew up here. And so she's writing this, this, this book about marriage in the United States between two Nigerian immigrants. Um, right, there she is, Mr. and Mrs. Doctor. And I'm trying to think who else. And then the, the person who won was James Hanahan uh, for Delicious Foods, which I love because of the... Um, you know, he basically in that in that book, um, the drug, uh, uh, the cocaine becomes a character in the novel. And so he does some innovative things with the novel that I think are fantastic. Um, and it's and it's also a very important and beautifully told story. So I think he had it all. And, and frankly, any of those could have won. You know, when you get to the last five or 493 books, um, they're all terrific. And I'm not surprised, of course, that, that another one, the Viet Thanh Nguyen, the sympathizer, uh, won the Pulitzer. You know, because at that point, really, they're all great books. Uh, and, you know, they're all fantastic books. 
and it's just it's just a little bit the three judges like this one in particular so and that's good, a good question good on you for reading almost 500 books i've sat on a couple of award committees as a bookseller and that is some intense work it but is intense to be able to read for 15 hours a day and have 500 free books in your library <laughs> yeah I gave them, you know, to friends and people and recommended people, you know, and, and, and frankly, I gave them a lot to the Kent Memorial Library. Very nice. You know, to support uh, our public libraries. Abby notes, she says, your views are like an antidote for the complete delusions that are out there. Some things never change. And I'm so glad to hear you speak. And thanks for caring about the core, she says. Um, <laughs> Suzanne Martinez, since the pandemic, are you writing different kinds of stories? Well, I mean, I, I'm in the middle of a dystopian, you know, uh, reading and, and, and also um, writing dystopian stories. Um, it's not that I'm pessimistic about this society, but I just see how easily it could go to a, a darker place. Uh, and it still might go to a darker place and it's already gone in a very dark place in 2020. Um, and I've always loved actually dystopian works from everything from 1984 to Brave New World to, you know, uh, and, and sort of, you know, things like, uh, you know, Latin American writers have write, written a lot of dystopian novels, great dystopian novels. Um, so, so that's kind of what I'm writing. And Nobody's Pilgrims, by the way, that's coming out uh, next year. It's a new novel. And uh, it's a dystopian story. And let me tell you, it's about three teenagers escaping the border. They're in the seven, in 17 and growing cross country. And they have evil people after them. And among things happening is a society collapsing because of a virus. And let me tell you, I wrote this book two years before anyone had ever heard of COVID. And it's not COVID, it's another virus. And, um, and so, so the society is collapsing because, you know, this virus is, is, is taking over people and they're trying to not just escape these evil people after them, but trying to not get sick. Uh, and so, um, so it, it's also a novel about resilience, how these three teenagers, these young people, working class, Nobody cares about them. Uh, they're nobody's pilgrims. And yet they fight for their place in the United States. And this fight, uh, it, it's called Nobody's Pilgrims. And I'll, I'll type it in, Nobody's Pilgrims. And, um, and out, in, uh, out in the spring of 2021. And, and so, the, you know, despite what's going on to them and around them, um, they're very resilient kids. And so I have a lot of, so for, for me, if somebody were to ask me, I have a lot of hope in the future, like in my kids and my 20 year old kids who are still fighting and getting involved in politics. And I kind of, in many ways, wrote it for them, you know, as adults. Um, it's about 17 year olds, but it's an adult, it's an adult novel. And it's because I feel like, you know, these young people, maybe they're not so old and decrepit like we are or I am. I'll just speak for myself, you know, uh, but I find a lot of energy and a lot of like, they, they won't give up, even though awful things are happening around them. And that kind of these characters, they're all different. One of them is from rural Missouri. Two of them are from the border, from Juarez and from El Paso, and they all get together and they, they want to fight for their place in this world. It reminds me a little bit of the Matt Mendez book. Have you read that? Which one? Uh, Barely Missing Everything, I think is the title. It's a young adult. It's about some boys. It's more of a coming of age story than a Yeah, mine is not a young adult. Mine is an adult novel. Okay, cool. So it's, it's a little different, yeah. I put, but I know Matt Mendes and he's a great writer. Yeah, he has a book about a few boys um, trying to get across the border and lots of things that they encounter. It's, yeah, and it's, in, this, in this one, it's only one of them is undocumented. The other one's a Chicano from El Paso. And then they meet up with this rural Missouri girl in, in a tiny little town in Missouri that hitches a ride with them. Fun. 
Very cool. You can pre-order that one from Bookworks. I went ahead and put the link in there. It's already for sale. You can find that at your favorite independent bookstore. And, and I just got a great blurb from Ben Fountain, by the way. Oh, nice. So yeah, Penn Hemingway Award winner and you know National Book Award winner. He loved it. Great. So. Okay, Emily has a question. She says, do you feel a certain expectation to write your immigrant characters in a certain way, especially with the challenges and negative light that is trying to be shown upon them in today's politics? Um, so I, I guess the short answer is no. <laughs> the short answer is it, I don't, you know, I, I, I don't write propaganda. I'm interested in stories. So I, I do write immigrant, if you see this, you know, this collection, for example, though the one I just wrote, uh, read from, you see immigrants in which in one story, you see them in a positive light. Like Julio, for example. Julio is the perfect example. You'll see this character if you read the collection. And then as you read into that same group of stories, you see Julio from a very different light from his wife's point of view. And he's beating his wife up. And, 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 and his wife is trying to escape him because of the, the, the abuse she's, she's doing to, to her. So, so for me, it is, it is playing with this perspective. And, and, you know, and I'm not trying to write just positive stories about immigrants. Or I'm trying to write these characters that live in my mind. And sometimes they're all flawed, but they're, and some of them are good fundamentally, but some of them are also good and flawed. And some of them are bad and trying to be better but maybe they're failing. And so, so, so I don't really see, I think if, I, if I'm trying to um, go against the, the current political narrative, is that it is that um, there's no one way to see Mexican immigrants. And certainly it's, it's not um, one way to see even a, a, a writer who is from a Mexican uh, American immigrant background. Because one of the things that frustrates me about you know, quote unquote, white readers, it, it's, they will say, oh, he's just writing about his community. And so, you know, if I read him, that's all I'm going to read about. And, and frankly, no, I, I'm actually writing philosophical philosophy and literature that actually will speak to you, even if you have no connection to Mexico or Mexican immigrants, and will open up your minds about psychology and struggle and, and, and not knowing who you are, but people have to give you a chance, especially white readers, you know, and say, this guy's writing more like kind of like Franz Kafka or like, uh, you know, or, or some other writer like that, not kind of pigeonholed and put in a little box of this is Latino lit only for Latino writers and readers. You know, I think that's, that's stupid. And so, so in many ways, I'm trying to break that, that, uh, that idea. In, in, in readers, but readers have to give you a chance, um, you know, and, and that's a question among, you know, that, that I'm always asking other people to give me a chance, read my work, and you'll see, yes, it is about immigrants, and yes, I'm challenging stereotypes, and I'm writing, you know, women who are powerful and, and in charge, and, and trying to remold their boyfriends, for example, in, in one of the stories, a fragments of a dream. She's trying to remold her boyfriend into a better man. And, uh, and, and so, you know, I'm trying to give the gamut of, of different immigrant stories, positive, negative, but also challenging you as a readership to take a, a writer who happens to be Mexican American and proudly so, but also to take him as a serious American writer. Um, and, and, and uh, you know, and that's always been a struggle, by the way, always a struggle. I think from what you read today, you definitely showed a lot of range. And that's one thing I'm interested in in your work is your exploration of genres. And what you've just described is basically saying that there has sort of been this creation, albeit artificial, of a certain genre of immigrant work and that you're trying to break break that mold which i think is really cool absolutely okay. but the, the first story i ever wrote was about a, a, a guy at yale a chicano at yale calling his mexican grandmother to to discuss uh, heidegger's philosophy of being towards death and so people said what the hell are you doing is this chicano literature is this philosophy is this what what is it and i'm, I'm trying to blow things up 
trying to open people's minds. Absolutely. Okay, we have another question from Mary, uh, Mary Ellen. What's your favorite part of the writing process and then your least favorite? <laughs> in a nutshell. Well, my favorite part is when I'm deep in a novel and nobody is, or, or a story and nobody's bugging me. Nobody's asking me to do another talk or an, and I do, and I love doing the talks because you have to do that. And I, and frankly, right now, you know, I, I've, I've done my work. So I'm actually happy it, for me, it's ex, expending myself because I'm done with, with the literary work that I was you know, trying to accomplish this week. But, you know, when I'm deep inside uh, a novel and characters and, and, and I have like, three months and nobody's going to bother me and, and I won't answer the phone and I turn everything off and I'm in, in, my, in my little loft here in, in above the garage behind that you see. My, my wife calls it my little apartment. And, and I just lose myself in these characters and stories and I'm arguing with them and I'm dreaming about them. And, and that's the best part. That for me is the best part when I have very little responsibilities in teaching or, 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 you know, and, and, and I love talking to people. I love talking to an audience, but it, it only is good if, if I've done my work, if I like, if I've, if I've done my, my, uh, my writing work for that day or that week, if I haven't done my writing work, then I'm, I'm itchy to get back to work. Um, you know, if I could have two of me, one just public out there, you know, telling you all the bullshit and propaganda and on Facebook, and then another guy just sitting there writing, you know, that would be the perfect, somebody can figure that out. That'd be the perfect situation. That might be something you need to explore in a short story. I, I need to clone myself. <laughs> all right, Valerie's reminding us to ask you about some forthcoming books. Um, okay. Atla Anthology. Yeah, so so there's a new. I'm going to type it in. Um, it's I'm the uh, an ed, the main editor um, of a new anthology. So first, it's Nobody's Pilgrims uh, that's coming out in the spring, I think, uh, of uh, of next year, and then of uh, Mexican. I'm just going to type it in so people know what it is. They have Nobody's Pilgrim listed for June 1st, 2021. That's right. also Cinco Puntos, an excellent press. They have tons of good titles. So this one, Nepantla Familia, an anthology of Mexican-American literature of families in between worlds. It's coming out. I am the main editor, and it's 30 works uh, coming out in the spring of 2021. And 25 of those 30 works have not been published. And these are, so this is new stuff you've never read anywhere before. And we're talking the heavy hitters of the Mexican American world from Sandra Cisneros, Reina Grande, um, Jose Rodriguez, Rigoberto Gonzalez, um, and more. Um, and it's essays, poetry, and short stories. Daniel Chacon, for example. Um, and, um, and, and in fact, by the way, Matt Mendez which you mentioned before, he has a new story in this. And it's all about this concept of Nepantla, which is a, an Aztec word of basically living in between, between English and Spanish, between the US and Mexico, between a, cult, a rural culture and an urban culture, um, you know, even psychologically in between worlds, the old world and the new world, the new American world. And so I, I had all these writers and a, a lot of them, I think most of them are my friends. You know, some are frenemies, but, but most of them are my friends. We're always competing with each other, you know. Um, and, uh, but I got them really good money and it's being published by the Whitcliffe Collections in San Marcos and Texas A&M Press. And I'm the main editor, so I got to, to decide. And the problem with being the editor is, you know, I had to turn down some of my friends who I thought their work was not good enough. In, in this collection, but they forgave me, you know, they, they, they forgave me. I, and I told them why, but, but you know, these are the people, and it's gonna be a great anthology of new work. As I said, 25 of the 30 works have never been published before. Um, and, and some of the heavy hitters in the, in the Mexican American um, writer world. And, and I think what, what, what people have seen, because we're getting some great blurbs, 
is oh my god the, the, the response is oh my god the quality is so 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 fantastic and this is what i'm telling people uh this is by the way the product of you know american dirt you know when people people i don't know if people want to talk about that but one of the things people miss about american dirt is that it's not just what she wrote and the issues and problems with her narrative but it's the response 30 years ago you would not have chicanos writing in the new york times in the new yorker uh, calling to question a writer published by the big five and it has to do with the maturation of this community we now have mexican-american writers who are presidents of this who are iowa writers workshop graduates who have won the big prizes whether it's penn faulkner or whatever we're finalists in the pulitzer prize so we will call people to task when they write something that's inauthentic 30 years ago, somebody wrote a stereotypical Mexican-American character, it was just the white readership would assume, oh, that's how Mexican-Americans are. No more, because I'm watching you. <laughs> and so are a lot of my friends. So that's what I'm saying. What people miss is the response. The response is what's, dif what's different. It's there now. And we are in positions of power to respond and respond in a thoughtful, critical way to what gets put out in our name or in the name of our communities. And I think it, you know, it happened to African Americans, it happened to Jewish writers, you know, before they were stereotyped, then they got educated, got better, got, got in positions of power. And now, you know, if you're going to write a Mexican American writer, you should expect very severe and critical feedback. And it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. I think you should do it, but you should just expect to do your homework in a, in a, in a very profound way. Oh, that's oh. interesting. I, I would like to explore more around what you just said and that people that you're, you would be okay with someone writing that character that's from another culture. Sure. Um, Armaine just ask also what issues you have with American dirt. I mean, that's, that could be a whole nother Zoom meeting. It, it could be an hour, but I mean, I, I read it only because uh, I knew I, was, I would be asked about it and I'm asked about it all the time. And, and I thought, uh, you know, I, I, she made a lot of mistakes. She, she made a lot of mistakes in, in perspective. So the, the main character is this woman who's a bookstore owner in Acapulco. And, and people show up in her bookshop, including somebody who's a narco who kind of falls in love with her. And then to escape, she escapes with her son, you know, going, going north. So some of my friends wanted to hang her. I did not want to hang her. I think her, the, the author, I think the, the, the character, her, her, you know, her heart was in the right place, but her characters were definitely wrong. They were written for a white audience. The, the main character does all sorts of things that a Mexican in that position as a bookstore owner in Acapulco would never do and would never have those perspectives or, or, or points of view. And, um, and, and it goes from the very small to like putting ketchup on your barbecue, which no Mexican would do, to not realizing that, that people showing up in front of her bookstore dressed in a certain way, that they're narcos. A Mexican would say, oh my God, they're narcos, like in a second. And she, of course, is, oh, you know, come on, come in and, and let's talk books. And, and, you know, and they're thugs in front of the bookstore waiting for you, but let's just, you know, fall in love and, 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 uh, and have this nice conversation. And it will never occur to me that, oh my God, the people waiting in front of the bookstore for you are your narco henchmen, you know? And so, so it, it, it's on little things on big things. And I think what burned a lot of writers, a lot of Latino writers is that she got millions of dollars for it. And, and there is better writing she makes mistakes on perspective, on point of view, in this novel. And, but it's an exciting novel. And, and what burns people is, you know, there are people uh, writing Luis Urea, for example, Reina Gran. I mean, there's a whole bunch of people who are writing better books on similar topics, and they're not getting the millions of bucks from the big five publishers. And I think it put them on notice. You know, we had, I mean, I did not, we, I, I didn't have it, but other writers and friends of mine kept me apprised of what was going on. They had meetings with these big five publishers and they now understand, you know, they, they just don't know the literature. They never bothered to, 
you know, to, to look and like, who's actually writing good stuff today that's writing on that same thing from an authentic perspective. And, and the, the other issue is she doesn't know Spanish. So if you're going to write a book in which, you know, 90% of it or, or in fact, 100% of it happens in Mexico and you don't know Spanish, dear God, why are you writing that book? You know, so, so it just, you know, it, I, I could see the problems with, with, with American Dirt, but I, I also felt she did it um, from a, you know, trying to bring the immigrant story to, to the fore. And by the way, I could have predicted this in 2016, because one of the things when we read those 493 books in the Penn Faulkner, oh my God, like 20% of them were about immigrants. And there were these white writers writing about immigrants. Why? It's a trendy topic. It's a topic that sells. And so, so for me, American Dirt was not a surprise. The reason she wrote it was because it, it sells. But, but the thing is, you have to get, you know, immigrant writers and Latino writers to be writing these books. And they're there. They just aren't given the chance. And the money is not thrown behind them. And the quality is there because they're winning the, the best prizes. Like, you know, American Dirt never won a single prize. Because it's, it's just a so-so novel. It's not a very well-crafted novel. But it's an exciting story. And a lot of, you know, white middle-class women liked it. You know. You're absolutely right. The immigration trope is so popular right now. It's popular. Janine Cummins took advantage of that, frankly, as did her publisher. American Dirt came out in January. It's October. It's still on and off the New York Times bestseller list, however many weeks later that is. Um, it's, it's crazy, but it, yeah. the one good thing it did do was it brought these conversations into publishing and book selling about uh, inclusivity and diversity. You know, those conversations that we yeah. say we've been having, but we're not doing anything to change. Yeah. And, so and, and her, her heart is in the right place, I think. You know, I, I, I don't think she's a, a bad human being, but she took advantage. Yeah, she could have written about anything, right? Right. But I think your point about the reaction to it is really a, a insightful because I think that's true is that looking at the conversation, no matter how complicated and how the publishers responded has shown a shift. So I, I really, that really has struck me. I think that's- it, It's a power shift. And believe yeah. me, another American dirt comes in, I'm gonna be writing in the New York Times and I'm gonna be ripping them. And they know that, and I'm not the only one. There will be right. plenty of people behind me with the education, the wherewithal to get in the New Yorker or the New York Times or the Houston Chronicle or the LA Times. And they know that, they know that now. And, and I think that's a maturation of this community of, of our Mexican-American literary community. 